Hey yo, what's good, Ken Folk? You already know who it is. It's yeah, boy. Fear the smile, man. We on this Hakuki Stories of the Senshin Senshin Gumi. Ain't never played it, G. I ain't gonna lie to you, but we gonna jump right into it. Hopefully, it's good. Game came out in 2014 for my Idea Factory, Design Factory, whatever that shit that is. Let's jump into it though. All right, it says, please input the protagonist's name. We already know what the business is. Fears in the building. Oh, so I got it. This uh fear. So this is Kyoto. It was awfully impressive. The there was no denying it. Even the simple hellos between people passing in the street seemed warm and friendly. They nodded and smiled to one another almost as if they were family, not strangers about on errands. Still, there was something else as well, something that made the city feel strangely cold. Almost as though there was a great invisible wall shutting out anyone who wandered in from the country. Um, it wasn't particularly comfortable, I had to admit. No, no, that's all in my head. I had walked quite some distance to reach Kyoto, and it occurred to me that my mind and body were both very tired. Even so, tiredness was no reason for me to stand about feeling sorry for myself. I couldn't afford to, after all. Um, excuse me. With new albaya forced resolve, I tried to stop a passerby. I'm sorry, but I seem to be a bit lost. Could you? I don't know what the hell that was about. What am I supposed to do now? I was lost again, but in a different sort of way. I sighed and found myself looking up at the darkening sky. The sun was beginning to set. The people I had spoken to had been unkind, and they'd given me the directions I needed, but couldn't have couldn't he have chosen a better time to leave the city? Apart from my father, there were only one person, other person in the city who I could rely on, Dr. Matsumoto. I guess you could jump to an encyclopedia. Okay, whatever. Dr. Matsumoto was a doctor in service to the shogunate. I had never met him myself, but my father put a great deal of trust in the man. He had told me that if I should run into any trouble during his absence, I was, con I was to contact Dr. Matsumoto. Unfortunately, Dr. Matsumoto was apparently out of town on business and would not return for some time. Was I too hasty? Perhaps I should have waited. True, it is rather rude to visit unannounced, which is which was why I had sent a letter ahead of me. Of course, if it had been gone for very long, then he had almost certainly not read my letter. Perhaps, I thought, I should have waited for a reply before traveling alone to a city I've never seen. But, no, I knew I could not have waited any longer. God damn. Coda, fear. Is something wrong, father? He paused for a moment and looked at me. I... Okay, now you got now you can talk. Work again. He had been leaving the house often, then sometimes for days at a time. How long will you be gone? Oh. There was no hiding my disappointment. Nonetheless, I wasn't a child anymore. I couldn't beg him not to go or some other foolishness. Yes, I'd be lonely, but I was much more worried for him. Please, Father, be careful. They say that the city of Kyoto is dangerous. He only smiled and nodded. Okay, you promise? father kept his promise a new letter arrived every day and i scarcely had the time to respond before another one would arrive he told me that he would he worried about me home all by myself then the letter stopped a whole month passed with no word from my father and i began to worry father they say kyoto is full of ronin 
it is not a safe place. Usually a samurai is paid by their house, but Ronin with no house to report to often rob people in order to make ends meet. There's nothing more than nothing more than violent criminals who hid behind the image of the samurai. Such is the state of the, such is the state of the city of Kyoto, the city of Ronin. Small wonder then then that I wore my for my father's safety. My mind would not concoct horrible possibilities and I inevitably found myself depressed and tense. Hmm. First, I suppose I need to find a place to stay. Lost in thought, I hadn't noticed that night had already fallen. If I was honest with myself, I hadn't the first idea how long it may take to find my father. I had taken some money with me, but it wasn't much, enough to last me a month, I hoped, if I used it wisely. If I could find father in that time, so much the better. If not, hopefully Dr. Matsumoto would have returned before my funds ran out. Should I be unable to find either of them, hey, yo, then it oh, seemed I would be forced to return home. Well, at any rate, I should try and be as frugal as possible. And so I lengthened my stride and set off down the street. Fortunately for me, men's clothing was much more conducive to such a pace than my usual dress would have been. I decided early on that Kyoto was far too dangerous for a girl from the country to explore alone. Wait, I'm a female? And that would be wise for me to dress like a man or at least a boy. I would have changed my goddamn name. What the fuck? <laughs> oh, they tripping, tripping. My disguise, such as it was, had proven successful. And I made it all the way to Kyoto unmolested. Perhaps it's just maybe because I can, since I'm faking to be a female, I can do the fear thing. I think it works. Perhaps that success had gone to my head and let me think a girl dressed as a boy could explore Kyoto as she pleased. But Kyoto is not a safe place. I should have remembered that. Instead, I had somewhere somehow convinced myself that whatever dangers the city hid didn't apply to me. Oi, so no oh, shit. I was about to discover otherwise. Huh? I spun around the street in front of me were three men, Ronin. Can I help you? I did my best to keep my voice calm as I reached in what I felt was nonchalant way for my Kodas Kodashi. Kodashi's original short katana. By the end of the Edo period, it referred to as a large wakisashi. It was usually worn as half of a pair with a larger sword such as a katana. Got you. My father had made me take lessons in self-defense. I'd keep with them and actually done rather well. My skill wasn't enough to defend against most attacks. Then again, perhaps it was my confidence in my skill that had put me in this situation in the first place. I'd messed up and let my guard down. My fault. There was a chance I could take them on and win, but there were three of them and one of me. Only then did I realize they were, full, they were far more interested in my sword than they were in me. But this is the sword wasn't just some blade I picked up. It had been passed down through my family for generations. There was no way I could give it to the Ronin. Unfortunately, I had a feeling they wouldn't understand. In such a situation, the best decision was undoubtedly to retreat. As I turned and ran as fast as my legs would carry me, gosh, they sure don't give up easily, do they? I feel like I, I'd been running for quite a while, but I could still hear the running behind me cursing loudly. I dug into an alley and flattened myself against the wall. After deciding they, were, they weren't too close, I crept farther into the alley. Someone had left a couple of sheets wood leaning against one of the houses. It was a perfect spot to hide. With luck, I thought as I knelt down to shuffle under them, this will get me out of this mess. Uh, something was wrong. I'd expect to hear the Ronin yelling at each other looking for me. But seconds turned into minutes and I heard nothing. I was about to sneak out and have a look when... They began to scream. What? 
What? My plan to investigate was immediately halted. Remaining silent and hidden was clearly more important. Still. It was then the true fear began to set in. There was something out there, something very, very dangerous, something quite possibly lethal. The possibilities were, well, my imagination conjured up no shortage of gruesome theories. Even so, I could feel that the itch of curiosity. I want to know what was out there. Slowly, carefully, I edged up to the corner and looked out. Cold moonlight glare back at me from the a cold moonlight glared back at me from the bare blade of a drawn sword. My eyes followed the blade up to the arm that held it, clad in a coat of light blue. Had this person saved me? But no sooner had it appeared, that hope was dashed. I could hear the Ronin beg for his life as he stumbled back. The person in the blue coat said nothing, just stepped forward with his sword raised. <laughs> a high screeching laugh cut through the man's scream. The blade fell through the air more like a butcher's cleaver than a sword. No technique, no skill, just death. The screen turned suddenly wet, caught and disappeared like air leaving a half empty bellows. My eyes went wide. I had just watched the murder. My eyes had gone so wide I thought they might never close. The Ronin had died with the first blow, but as I watched the blades kept falling, carving deep lines into the corpse. The soft slip of a blade through flesh, the crack as it as it struck bone, a silent creep of blood across the ground. I felt nothing from them but madness. The only desire was raw animal violence. Whatever they were, it wasn't human. They were broken. I could feel my throat closing up. I couldn't breathe. A warm, dark smell brushed across my face. It took me a moment to recognize the coppery tang of blood. An icy bolt of fear ran down my spine falling its way out onto my limbs and freezing me in place. I was terrified. What was I going to do? What could I do? You have to run, Fear. I forced my jaw open and drew a ragged breath. This is the only chance I had to get, I had chance I'd get, I had to. But my body still numb with fear was less than responsive. I lurched sideways as the wood stack against the building with a rough clatter it collapsed. The creatures turned, their blue coats and drenched in blood with hideous grins split their inhuman faces, and they shook with animal excitement at finding fresh prey to slaughter. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, I had to run. I couldn't die yet, but my legs refused to move. That hideous cackling laughter began again. I was going to die. My body was frozen with terror. I couldn't even scream. This was it. This was the end. What? I watched them raise their bloody swords, the moon glinting off the metal. Then there was a flash of light and a soft splash of blood. I could feel it, warm, sticky. Bob began to rise in my throat, but before disgust took hold, I heard a voice. The words suggested disappointment, but the voice sounded happy. As he spoke, the strange man smiled, almost as if he were enjoying himself. I 
ひどい言い草だな。He laughed. 否定はしないのか。The man called Saito side with the air of a long suffering companion looked over at me. でもさ、あいつらがこの子を殺しちゃうまで黙って見てれば、僕たちの手間も省けたのかな。His tone was light. But his words confirmed my fears. I had left the frying pan, yes, but now I was in the fire. So, no. Sknoctomo sono handan wa oreta chiga kudas beki mono de wan nai. Huh? Then there was something, someone in charge of these two. Their conversation seemed to suggest they were part of an organization of some sort. As I thought about it, I remembered hearing stories of a group of men with blue coats. Ah, my thoughts were interrupted by a dark shape sliding into view. More、well, like Biakia, I ain't gonna lie. Oh, I swallowed hard. The moonlight shone off his smooth, dark hair. For reasons I couldn't fathom, in that moment, the light in his hair made me think of fluttery flower petals. Almost as if they were cherry trees for blooming out of season. His voice was cold and quiet, like a blade of ice. Blue white moonlit, moonlight lit his slender face and shone from the blade he held pointed at my chest. But it wasn't a sword that made me breathe, catch, made my breath catch in my throat. I'm sorry. It was his eyes. They were fierce and hard. But somewhere behind them, I could catch a glimpse of something else. There could be no doubt that he was prepared to kill me, and yet he looked troubled. Not kindness, but perhaps mercy. I nodded. There was no doubt he meant every word he said. He stared at me for a moment, then grimaced, and with a sigh, put his sword away. What? I was too surprised to stop myself from speaking, and it quickly became apparent that I wasn't the only one. Are? In this car, he's got a son. Conoco, Saki no Micha Tandesio. As he spoke to the man he called Hijikata, his eyes narrowed. The man called Hijikata frowned back at him. Ichi, you can't go to Shabir and Janeo. Hetana Hanasio Kikasechimoto. I wasn't quite sure what they meant, but it was clear enough that what I seen was something they wanted to keep hidden. Still, the more they said, the more I understood, despite the fact that none of us wanted such a thing. The way he looked at me made me feel as if he read my mind. Perhaps it would be best if I didn't think too hard about things I wasn't supposed to think about. The man they called Saito spoke with quite confidence. He glanced around, possibly looking for another witness. Other witnesses, he looked down at the creature he killed, almost as he thought he'd forgotten the whole ordeal. He peered down at the corpse, his face an emotionless mask. When he looked back up at his companions, however, his eyes narrowed. He was right. Even I had heard stories about a gang of cruel men in blue coats who cut people down in the streets. But, no, no, don't think. Ignore them. I did my best to stir my, with myself, but it came out sounding more pleading than commanding. 
My mind swirled with the thoughts and worries. I was being drawn into their world. A world where there is nothing strange and carrying on a normal conversation in the dead of night. With corpses for company. Hijikaka thought for a moment before he spoke. あとは山崎君が何とかしてくれんだろう。He gave a derisive bark of laughter. ま、あとは俺らが黙ってりゃ世間も勝手に納得してくれるだろうよ。Okay. He looked directly at me when he spoke, and I got the distinct feeling that his words weren't for his companions. It was common for people to be murdered in Kyoto. It was a dangerous city after all. I knew that, of course. But to see it happen, that was something else entirely. If death was such an easy thing in Kyoto, I thought then the city itself must surely be mad. Uh, I didn't realize immediately, immediately that he was speaking to me. When I did, my eyes went wide. What do you mean, you saved me? Well, he did have a point. Despite their threats, they had saved my life. I stood up. As steadily as I could manage, brush some of the some of the dirt off my sh clothes and bowed. Um, thank you very much. I apologize for not thanking you earlier. I was there was so much going on. I was a little confused. I glanced up glanced up at them tentatively. The man called Saito was showing some confusion of his own. His eyes were wide, and he had an expression I couldn't place. His Hizakata looked as as though he'd taken a bit of something a bite of something sour i i know it seems weird to say that but he told me i should say thanks so i looked up saito and his were both looking pointly at anything but me and the third man was shaking with laughter ah. <laughs> He broke out in laughter again, so much so that he was forced to wipe a few tears from his eyes as he straightened up. Thank you for helping me. Not quite sure what else to do. I bowed again. Whatever mirth I might have inspired, gone, inspired, gone. The man called Saito spoke with quite urgency. His Akata nodded. Though the man who called himself ok Okita grabbed hold of my wrist, gave me a smile, and began to lead me down the street. His grip was a t was a touch too tight, but to be friendly, his fingers like iron cables around my arm. There was no question about my situation. If I ran, I would die quickly, at least. But still, even if I did as I was told, my life was in the hands of these strange men. I set my jaw and stood up as straight as I could. My eyes met those of Saito, and he as he looked up from the blood-stained coat. His words were like a dagger in my stomach. What was going to happen to me? Was I was I going to die? As we walked through the cold Kyoto night, I felt horror begin to crawl its way up my spine once again. The cause of my horror wasn't the gruesome end that almost certainly awaited me, but something else entirely. I've spoken with these men and watched them speak to one another. 
not a freak from a still warm corpse so soaked in blood. That I had done such a thing terrified me in altogether a different way. Perhaps I thought this is what it's like to go mad. It's my life.